outro cast. So cutting straight into it, Dead Asleep is the new film, and I'm familiar with a lot of your other work, but when did you finish Dead Asleep? Gosh, not long ago. Um, I mean, we finished, finished uh, approximately a month ago, I guess. So what is that? We're in December now, October. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, as a licensed PI, I may know a thing or two about Freedom of Information Act requests. Was that a big part of the process for you with this? Because you do actually have footage, video footage of the accused in the police station. Is that how you got that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We did. You know, we, we reached out to the law enforcement agencies and, and asked and, and we were able to get um, these these videos in the interrogation room, which which to me was was a, a very interesting part of the of the film, for sure, because we're seeing Randy and, and his behaviors, I think, you know, both in Haverhill Park when the police first arrive and the body cam footage that we have of him, as well as, you know, when they have him in and they're questioning him in the police office. And just to be able to see him post this event and how he's reacting was fascinating. It's a fascin fascinating psychological study. Yeah. How much of the overall story did you know prior to starting production on it versus the end result? In other words, did you know everything or were there so many twists and turns as a result of getting all that video footage and notes and speaking to the experts? I think we knew we knew most. I mean, look, what's interesting about this one is the crime. Like, there's not that much to know about the crime per se. Right. I mean, he stabbed her 25 times and he was convicted. So that's what was an interesting part of this story to me is that it wasn't about is he guilty or innocent? It was really about was he sleepwalking? And so we knew for the most part, the, the beats to the story, right? What, what I found was more fascinating and, and maybe more interesting was talking to sleep experts, talking to Dr. Paula Bruce, the psychologist, and really sort of getting different perspectives on the brain and the possibilities of it. The fact that Randy could or could not have been sleepwalking, how each and every one of us sort of experience things differently, how our brain chemistry can change from a minute to minute basis, depending on what our history is, what our background is, what our night before was. And so that to me, and really unraveling that, the psychology and the science of it kind of changed things for me as we were going through it. Your last few projects that I'm aware of have been very dark. It's it's not like you come away from it hating the world per se, but it's not, you know, the, the greatest <laughs> humanity per se. What is it that draws you to wanting to cover this kind of stuff? Were you, for example, a big horror fan, a big true crime fan in general, or is it, these are just the great, great stories to tell? I mean, I think they're great stories to tell. I mean, that's what draws me to a story, uh, great stories to tell, but also really, I've, I've always been fascinating with, fascinated with people and why people do what they do and kind of the, the frailty of the human condition. And so, that's what really is interesting to me. And, and also unexplained things, you know, how, how is it possible that Randy Herman was sleepwalking when he killed Brooke Preston? I don't know the answer to that. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with sort of having done this exploration through this documentary and coming away with it. You know, I mean, every single time I'd watch it, I'd be like, he was sleepwalking. And then the next time I'd be like, no, he, he wasn't sleepwalking. And next time I'd be like, he wasn't sleepwalking, but he was traumatized. And so he blacked it all out. And so I like that element of it too, a story where you can come out of it and that conversation continues that you keep talking about the possibility of was he sleepwalking or was he not? Yeah. Well, on a different wavelength, the first project of yours that I know that I saw was the Quiet Riot documentary, Well, You're Here. Well, now you're here. There's no way back. <laughs> Was that a thing where you were a big fan of the LA rock scene or is that just a cool gig and you did that? Well, I mean, I was a big fan of Quiet Riot. Uh, I didn't, I, not so much the LA rock scene, but Quiet Riot. I mean, I was in, you know, I grew up with Quiet Riot and I loved Quiet Riot and it was, it was very nostalgic to me and it was very interesting to me and to be in these like, to me, iconic rock stars presence was just, cool. Um, and, and so that was, and I thought that that, you know, that film had a lot of, it had everything you want from a rock doc. It's like got sex, drugs, and a lot of heart and soul. And so I thought that story was, was fascinating. It had everything you'd want in a rock doc, except a Carlos Cavasso interview. 
Well, true, yes. <laughs> no, I thought it was a spectacular film because Quiet Riot is one of the most influential bands that people don't really put Nobody it all together that. and realize that that was an in influential band. So it's cool that you and Regina got to tell the story like that, but that was not your only Quiet Riot related project. You, you also worked on How Randy Rhodes Met Ozzy. Uh, I assume that was a coolness project rather than a cash grab again, per se. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, any of these, look, I mean, not many of these projects I have to say are cash grabs really, you know? I mean, there's, you put so much, you put so much of your heart and your soul into it. You put so much time into researching and reaching out to people. And, and to me, I mean, that's why I do what I do. That's why I make documentaries because, because I love, being able to sort of walk into somebody's life that I have no right to be there. I have no reason why I would ever be in these people's lives. And all of a sudden I'm in a room meeting rock stars or meeting, you know, guys convicted of murder or meeting prime ministers or meeting anarchist chocolate makers, you know, that I get to meet these people that, that, that I have no right to meet. And, and they always influence me in such a magnificent way and, and help me be a better person and help me sort of see the world through not just my own eyes, but but eyes of, of many different people. Yeah, uh, this is a compliment, not a, a backhanded kind of thing. You've done cinematography work. I find that the cinematographer is often the smartest person on the film set, very understated, very under the radar. The average person doesn't know what they do. They've heard of the job title, but they couldn't tell you good cinematography versus bad cinematography. But you were able to do that on the Quiet Ride doc. Now you're a director. Was the long-term goal to be a cinematographer or was it actually to be a director? A good question. I don't know that I ever really planned it. <laughs> I wish I could say that there was a very sort of methodical approach that I had to sort of, I'm gonna make this career move and this career move and then this career move. But it was very, it was, it was much more fluid than that for me. I mean, I love, I love images and I love um, putting a camera up and I love, I love being able to document people and their surroundings and their places. And, and, and to me, it was sort of a natural progression that I went from, you know, being a cinematographer to being a director. And it, it really happened, honestly, I think really that switch happened the most succinctly with abducted in plain sight where, where I just, because I did both on that one. Mm -hmm. um, and now I sort of, I sort of go, oh my gosh, it was so much work to do both cinematography and directing on projects now. And so I leave that to other people, but, um, but I still come with a very visual eye um, and I come with a, a pretty great understanding of what, what each element uh, for each department takes. I know how much time it takes to set up an interview. I know where to put a light. I know if something's not working, you know, a light might be in the wrong place or we might be on a wrong lens and I can pretty quickly sort of you know, articulate what's what's not working about a shot, um, while also hopefully still giving the cinematographers their their freedom to kind of bring something more beautiful than what I could do to the project. Well, taking a step back, did you always know that you wanted to be in the documentary sphere versus comedy? Um, not always, but it really happened for me. I spent about five years traveling. It was sort of you know post undergraduate, pre-graduate school for me. I, I traveled throughout Europe and, and Asia for about five years and I was just a gypsy. And it was during that time where I, I picked up a camera really for the first time and I, I realized the beauty of, of an image and, and, and how you can sort of manipulate those images and, and make them more beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And storytelling was something that I've always loved, public storytelling. I, I have a theater background and, um, and travel and I, and at that moment, I was like, what can I do that involves and kind of brings all those three elements together? And for me, it was it was documentaries. And I knew kind of from my my mid 20s on that that's really what I wanted to be doing. So it sounds like you're kind of a seeker and that also you didn't find yourself right away after school. You 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 were a work in progress before you made it. And yes, I'm saying that you made it. I, I, I still think I'm a work in progress. I think <laughs> I'll always be a work in progress. <laughs> So yeah, we were connected to talk about Dead Asleep per se, but I read somewhere there might be a Netflix series or project in the works for you. 
Yes. Yeah. I I'm, I'm right now I'm working on a Netflix, uh, series and, um, hopefully if all goes well with that, um, you should see it around spring or summer of next year. Hmm. And then my last question has nothing to do with the excellence of dead asleep. You have to say the name that many times. So the metadata and the bots pick it up. So you say <laughs> dead asleep, dead asleep, dead asleep. Uh, the choir ride documentary, you and team, did speak to the greatest of the greatness, but Kwai Rai were contemporaries of Van Halen. In all of your rock star interactions, your, your bio, when you say, you know, you've spoken with rock stars or prime ministers and chocolate makers that are anarchists and all that, were there any David Lee Roth interactions over the years? Unfortunately not. No, I wish. <laughs> I wish. You never know because Van Halen and Kwai Rai were kind of contemporaries to that same LA club scene. So I thought I was going to hit it out of the park where you can go, actually. As a matter of fact, yeah. You know, Frankie Benali passed away recently. Yes, unfortunately he passed away, but they're back on the road with Rudy Sarzo intact. I know, can you believe it? I mean, I know, rest in peace, Frankie. <laughs> yes, uh, to say the least. Well, yeah. the last question I have is we've established you have future work, you got current work, things are great. But do you actually have aspirations to do a different kind of film project that you haven't yet tackled? I mean, I always have aspirations to do a project I haven't yet tackled. Um, I, think that, I think that it's always, the goal is to push ourselves creatively and to do things that scare us. I mean, that's, that's always the goal as soon as you know, as soon as you start feeling comfortable and as soon as you feel like, you know, you can sort of arrive on set and you know exactly what to do and what questions to ask. And you're not just a little bit, um, not nervous, but, but just a little bit static, I guess it's, it's a bad place to be. So I think, I think it's always, you know, always finding different, different stories to tell different ways of telling them whether they're prime or, or, or not. I mean, I keep, I keep thinking I want to do something about puppies. <laughs> okay, oh, that's okay. so cute. <laughs> that was not it what I was. A little expecting. bit of a palate cleanser, right? <laughs> but look, I love that. I love the crime genre, and I think there's so yeah. many amazing, amazing stories um, to tell that that really give us and, and different ways to tell the story. And that's to me what's so incredible about just the documentary genre is you can do and tell these stories in such incredibly different ways. And I'm not sure that the scripted format offers that in such a magnitude the way the documentary format does. So, so I think there's a lot of documentaries still to be made and a lot of different ways to make them still ahead. Whatever that documentary is that comes from you next, whatever the carrier it is coming out through, I look forward to it and really thank you for your time, Scott. Keep up the greatness. Thank you, Dan. Outrocast.